Thank you everyone for joining us here on the Real Estate Investor Show. Hard money for real estate investors. We are Carolina Capital Management. We are lenders in the Southeast for real estate investors. If you're interested in borrowing money, click on the carolinahardmoney.com and hit the apply now tab. If you're a passive investor looking for passive returns, click on the accredited investor tab. Don't, for uh, don't, don't forget <laughs> to like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell and sign up <laughs> with Wednesdays with Wendy. <laughs> Wendy donates 30 minutes per person on Wednesdays to talk anything about real estate. Mm -hmm. You can talk anything else you want, but you're wasting your time if you don't. Um, get on her calendar. She's usually booked a couple of months in advance. Yep, love, love to have the opportunity to help you. And that information is also over there in, in the chat. And while we're talking about the chat, there's a chat box on the right or underneath, depending on the platform that you're viewing us from. So if you have any questions or comments, please share. And without further ado, I do, I do. Um, Sharub, uh, do we have any special guest graphics that we can bring up? <laughs> Aren't we something? <laughs> okay. So after graduating with a degree in engineering and then an MBA from Ohio State, the Ohio State University, yeah, the big o. Uh, Paul Moore entered a management development track at Ford Motor Company in Detroit. After there, or being there five years, he and a partner established a staffing company, which they ended up scaling and sold uh, to a publicly traded yeah, firm. That's what I'm talking about. And, and I like this after a brief retirement because <laughs> nobody last, retires. <laughs> oh, we always go to what's next. You get refired rather than retired. Paul started investing in real estate in the year 2000 because he's not scared of Y2K, but he did that uh, in order to preserve his wealth. And that's really why we do it. Yeah. Uh, Paul completed over 85 uh, real estate transactions and then started focusing in on commercial real estate in 2010. Which we like to. Uh, an author of a couple of books in commercial real estate and is the managing partner of Wellings Capital, a private equity real estate firm. Paul is married with four, I'm assuming wonderful children. It says, it says <laughs> children, but I bet they're all big. <laughs> they're all grown up. Uh, we, uh, and, and He's Paul, saying no. <laughs> we can see him over on the side. Him, no, they're not. <laughs> um, Paul lives in Virginia. We, we, we met Paul several years ago mm -hmm. and, uh, the Mid Atlantic uh, Investors. What is it? What was it summit. called? A summit. Mid -Atlantic yeah, summit. I remember that. It wasn't even the Mid Atlantic Summit at the time, but it was the beginnings of the Mid Atlantic Summit, which is an awesome event. Years ago. Yeah. And um, we all think the same. And I know you're probably tired of sitting in the green room eating green MMs. Yeah, we're going to so bring him, him out. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, it's really great to be here. You guys are high tech. Yeah. <laughs> We're bona fide. Yeah, you are bona fide. <laughs> we we do this to kind of divert people from thinking that we know stuff. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love that strategy. Thank you so very much. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier that we're, we always talk about our mastermind groups that we're in and how people need to find a group of like-minded individuals mm -hmm. that tribe. Uh, they will help them raise their own bar. And so we talk about collective genius all the time. Mm -hmm. You gave a presentation last quarter that uh, really hit home with me. And I wanted to just kind of touch on that. And it has to do with investors and, and, and real investors, people who have uh, made money. And, and again, this all depends on where you are. If you're getting a late start, or if you had an early start and maybe let's say you didn't invest wisely and you had to, you know, start back over again. You didn't mention uh, that in my bio. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> it that happens. Short, <laughs> short retirement. Uh, but <laughs> what, what most people are doing, they're, they're trying to preserve the capital that they have and uh, still continue to get a, a decent return. Do you want to touch on that a little bit, what, what most true investors are looking for? You know, I think there's a difference between speculating and investing. And when I retired at the ripe old age of 34, uh, I did not know the difference. You know, I started speculating and I thought I'm a full-time investor now, but I was actually a full-time speculator. I was throwing money to the bottom of holes in the ground, you know, thinking it would produce a hundred times as much oil and it produced zero. And uh, I got my friends involved in that one. And uh, also, um, I actually invested with somebody in your area, in Charlotte. And they actually told me they were getting 3% a month returns. And the, that 3% return landed them in 158 years of jail time. And they still oh, wow. won't tell all 2,000 investors where they hid the money offshore. I don't get that. But anyway, it's been 20 years. And uh, so anyway, but seriously, I, I was an entrepreneurial investor, which is really a speculator. You know, investing is when your principles generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And, you know, speculating is when your principle is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And I was definitely a speculator. I wanted to get the same thrill out of investing that I got from being an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs typically chase shiny objects and they have a lot of fun and they're always in startup mode and it's exciting. But being an exciting investor can also mean being a, a broke investor. Right. Uh, Paul, Sam <laughs> Paul Samuelson was the first economist to win the Nobel Peace Prize from the United States. And Samuelson said, that investing should be boring. He said it should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. He said, <laughs> if you really want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. <laughs> yep. I like the limit of $800. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's funny. I, the last time I was in Las Vegas, I went to a, the slot machines, which obviously that's just guessing. Um, I was up 20 bucks and I went, I'm done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, Cause usually you lose once you get up 20, you're done. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, so that was yeah. all my excitement. Um, yeah. But yeah, retaining, re, re, retaining your wealth is, is almost as difficult as building it in the first place. Um, because you're looking at things from a different lens through a different lens because you're in a different place. So you tend to do things that are a bit more risky. And um, I mean, I, I love that you call it a speculative um, uh, in investment because that's really, really what you're doing. So, so what did you do to change that? I became a boring investor. <laughs> <laughs> so what's boring to you? Well, you know, that, and that was the, the crux of my talk at Collective Genius, a boring investor, you know, they're looking for true wealth. My wife was lamenting this morning. She goes, you know, so what's our company worth and how much cash do we have? Well, there's a big difference because mm -hmm. true wealth, I think, is having assets that generate cash flow. Warren Buffett said, if you don't learn to make money while you sleep, you'll have to work until you die. And so I think, you know, it, it, but it can be a little boring. It's not cutting edge. It's not going out with, you know, Elon Musk inventing the latest, greatest thing. It can right. be that, but those are the exceptions. And that's why there are books and biographies about these folks, because they built something, you know, that was incredibly speculative that worked. But for the most of us, investing should more fall into the boring category. So you know, uh, boring investors attain true wealth. They also enjoy real freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, gold miners in the, the 49 gold rush and then in the 1880s and 90s gold rush in Alaska, you know, very, very few of them broke even. Very, they, had, they, they had a lot of excitement along the road. Very few even got there to the Alaska through the uh, pass there in Alaska. Uh, I went and visited there uh, about a year and a half ago, and 
you know, we've all heard this, but I'm going to make the point anyway. The boring people in those gold rushes made the most money on average. And of course, that was the people that owned the hardware stores, mm -hmm. the Supply. logistics operation, the mm -hmm. hard, you know, the hotels. Uh, when in the Nor North Dakota oil boom, when we lost about a million, million two, uh, a bunch of friends and I flushing it to the bottom of a hole that didn't produce any oil. We went on to build a multifamily facility to house those oil workers, and we made millions of dollars mm -hmm. housing oil workers in just a handful of years. And so, but it's boring. It's a lot more boring to, you know, ho house oils work oil workers than drill for oil. That's um, right. <laughs> but boring investors avoid hidden costs. I mean, there's hidden costs when you're always in startup mode, like I was for years, chasing shiny objects, you're always learning, you're always trying, you're building. And it's never, you never, it's like the airplane that, you know, the jet that's designed with, I think it's what, 800 horsepower, but almost all that's used to get up to the normal altitude. When you're cruising, they use very little of that horsepower to cruise from LA to New York. But, mm -hmm. um, but if you're always in that high burn rate, you know, always going up to your elevation, you know, if you do that continually, you're going to burn out and there's a hidden cost for your family. You said, I have four kids. I got three great kids and one other one. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> My 16 year old, whenever she hears that, she loves to jump in front of the camera and say, it's me. I'm the other one. Anyway. Um, That's too funny. <laughs> but uh, boring investors invest in boring assets. I mean, how can you be more boring than self storage? Think about it. It's four pieces of sheet metal, a floor, and a door. Oh, and there's some rivets. But think about it. It's boring. <laughs> Where where's the value adds in self storage? Well, there are some, but they're mm -hmm. kind of boring. And it's it's really it, it. But that's the kind of thing that basically makes money. I had a podcast for years called how to lose money. And uh, on that podcast, that we, talk, <laughs> we talked to people who lost money on their way to success and all the lessons they learned from it. The boring investors apply those lessons. They have a long view, like Buffett said, my preferred hold time is forever. And they're basically the opposite of day traders. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I love the the difference between speculation because I, I I talk to a lot of people, especially in real estate, are like, well, well, Jonathan, I'm 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 just in growth mode right now. I need that twelve to fifteen percent annualized return because I'm in growth mode. I'm like, well, that's short term or short sighted growth mode. You can compound interest in a relatively safe place that can still create growth. It just doesn't create the cash flow. So there's a difference. Uh, would, would you agree with that or, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It's, you know, we have to, I think this is probably obvious to all of your listeners, but I was telling my 16 year old daughter, I do have a underage daughter. She's 16. And last night she was asking me about investments and she said, well, you know, what about an 18% return or something like that? Mm -hmm. I said, well, when you're getting those high returns, you've got to factor in the risk of loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, complete this sentence. Low risk leads to low return. High risk leads to, and of course total she's loss. thinking high return, <laughs> but it's a high return or total loss. And so <laughs> you've got to factor that possibility in. So 18% times maybe 60% with the chance that you'll lose, you know, 40% chance you'll lose it all gets you right back to that 10 or 11% range. And so, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree that most assets are either cash flowing or growing. There are exceptions. Our company thinks we've found some of those, but uh, it, it's really hard to get both. Well, you know, we we really like that um, self storage arena too. We're hopping into it ourselves. Oh yeah. Um, and we're oh yeah. We're I knew really, that. That's yeah, exciting. We're really excited about that. I I just did the um, due diligence walkthrough last last weekend, and uh, and and it's you know, it's not sexy. There's nothing sexy about it, you, right. but you know, it's so similar to just a plain old fix and flip deal. You know, you, you see what needs to be repaired. Um, you take care of those repairs. You can increase the, the rents and, and, and it's all about marketing too. It's really, it's too simple. Yeah, it really and, is simple. And, and, and on the finance, I mean, we've always, love them on the finance side because they're 
number one, they're pretty simple. Um, and, and we, and we like to lend. We, we, we like to say any <laughs> moron can make money on self storage. And hopefully we'll be one of if, those morons. <laughs> if, uh, if, S, if the SBA loves making loans on something, then it's a kind pretty, of dummy pretty proof. good chance that it's a, it's a moneymaker. Um, yeah, that's absolutely they, true. They typically don't like uh, making a loan on a business and a piece of real estate and then giving you uh, cash out for extra expenses. <laughs> Yeah, that, but that, they do. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> so, so let's talk about your uh, self-storage book. What's it called? Yeah. It's called Storing Up Profits. Oh, How nice. to wait? I mean, capitalize on America's <laughs> obsession with stuff by investing in self-storage. That's awesome. Sweet. I like that. Hold it up again so people can see that because we right. really it's we right want to give them the opportunity to get it. look at that. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. That that used to be my running joke about self storage is that we as Americans will not get rid of our stuff. We have a love affair with our stuff, mm -hmm. and some of our stuff, which is typically worth about five hundred dollars, is so important that we have to get a unit that is also heated and air conditioned because we want to make sure that our stuff is comfortable in between the times that we go visit it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's you know, great. I had to take out a, um, a facility, a storage facility, just at one unit um, for my Airbnb stuff. And while I was signing up for it, there was a woman in the office that had been um, uh, renting for 17 years. Wow. 17. One unit for 17 years. I asked her what was in there. Well, stuff my mama passed down to me that she doesn't want in her own house. So what are you going to do with that? Wow. Yep. <laughs> That's one of the reasons self storage is so recession resistant. It's one That's of right. them. Yeah, for That's sure. right. We, we really like it. Well, as you're moving up the economic ladder, you tend to buy stuff and mm -hmm. you don't get rid of the stuff that you have. You don't replace stuff. You just accumulate more. And then at some point you're, empty nesters, or maybe you're moving down the economic ladder. You don't want to get rid of that stuff. So you still need a right. place to put it. And yeah. it's, it, it's a beautiful thing. Now let's talk about the uh, value add piece. Yeah. Uh, most of self storage is really mom and pops. You see a 52%. lot of, you see a lot of REIT yeah. uh, <laughs> type properties, but there's most of really the majority are, smaller mom and pop operations, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, mom and pops have a bunch of characteristics. I list those early in the book. And one is the attitude. If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, we don't need to advertise or market. And that was true for many years. The great news is a lot of the self storage owners, mom and pops, they still believe that. Mm -hmm. And so they're leaving incredible upside on the table. They don't care because cap rates have compressed and doubled the value of their facilities in a short time. And they're just cash cows to them. They're big metal boxes that spit out money. They don't view them as a retail business and as a piece of real estate. And that's mm -hmm. to our advantage because when we acquire an asset like that, we can add those things, those value adds like a showroom where you sell locks, boxes, tape, and scissors and make upgrades and sell insurance and where you can, uh, you know, basically you can take them through uh, why they might want this end unit or this, you know, this uh, this upper level unit that you know is away from ground level. There's all kinds of things we can do. Uh, there's all often they have extra acreage with them, five or ten extra acres out back that you can expand on, or mm -hmm. more easily right now gravel them incrementally and add boat and RV storage and then turn that into pavement. If it really works later, um, you can do marketing. You can, you know, across the board pricing is something they don't do. Can you imagine, excuse me, it's something they do. Uh, can you imagine them thinking like a hotel or airline and pricing different on different days of the week? or for different unit sizes, depending on the demand and supply in the area. There's That's all right. kinds of things that can be done, all kinds of value adds. And if, if you let me, I'll take you through just one example of how powerful this can be. Awesome. Please, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
let's just do something simple. Let's do something you can do the day after you buy a facility. Let's say you bought a facility in Kansas and you looked around and you said, oh, there's no, there's not much U-Haul in this area. So you contact U-Haul, you get a contract with them, you park some trucks out front, you don't spend any capital money up front at all, uh, except maybe to buy a computer terminal just to do the U-Haul on. And let's say you can add between one and 5,000 a month in commission from U-Haul. Let's use 3,000 a month. Okay, so 3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. Now here's the formula. In residential real estate, we know that it's residential real estate's based on comps. But in commercial real estate, of course, the value is based on a formula. And that formula is the value equals the net operating income divided by the rate of return or the cap rate. And so with a constant cap rate, if we can increase the numerator, let's say $36,000 a year, that's the U-Haul, divide that by a cap rate of, let's just say, you know, they're running four or 5% right now for self stores. Let's say 6%, which is more conservative. In other words, higher number, higher cap rate, lower value. Okay, $36,000 divided by 6%, you just added 600,000 to the value of your facility. Wow. So if you bought the facility for a million dollars, that's half, let's say half a million in equity, half a million in debt, you just added over 100% to the value of that equity, that half a million just became worth 1.1 million just mm -hmm. by adding U-Haul. And there's a whole lot of other things you can do, including add a billboard, add a cell tower, a propane filling station, an ATM, charge insurance and late fees, add the point of sale items. Uh, you can raise rent by 10% and add you know, perhaps 25% to the value of your equity just from raising rent by mm -hmm. 10%. And people don't leave. Think about it. If I had an apartment unit, I was leasing you for a thousand a month in Charlotte, uh, and I raised the rent 10%, you might say, ah, I'm going to leave rather than spend another $1,200 this year. But if I raise your $100 storage unit by 10%, you might say, ah, eh, that irritates me. But for an extra 10 bucks a month, I'm just not going to move my stuff down the street. And that person ends up staying there 17 years through, uh, you know, maybe 34 rate increases to a year. That's and right. think about this too. It catches inflation. If I'm renting out a large warehouse to Amazon or a factory, or, you know, it might be 10 or 20 years I'm locked in on the lease. With mm -hmm. self-storage, I can raise the rates every month and capture a lot of that inflation we're seeing right now. Yeah, where, where I am, this unit that I was telling you about that I'm renting, started out at $45 a year and a half ago. Every three months, they send me an increase. Every three months. And every three months, I get mad and say, dang it, I'm going to pack up, move out of here. I'm yeah. still there. <laughs> and and I'm sitting at $75 a month. Wow. For the same thing that I rented for $45 a month a year and a half ago. Okay. Now multiply that by 1,000 units. Ouch. And basically they just added 30,000 a month. That's 360,000 a year to their income. Cause there's really no cost increase, you know? Right. And uh, what did I say? $360,000 a year, divide that by a 6% cap rate. You've got a $6 million value increase yeah. just from raising rents and adding yeah. no capital expense. That's just crazy. So you get forced appreciation. And then, yeah. now this doesn't add as much uh, value, but you can also add in, management efficiencies by doing a lot of automated stuff with the, the gates, the keypads, the automated locks, uh, people to be able to pay their payments online and be able to rent online, all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That's absolutely so we'll true. Increase efficiencies as well. Yeah. yeah I mean, we, we talked about the mom and pops. I mean, you touched on, but most of them are under market rents and a lot of them are, substantially under market rents. And we right. were looking at one, it was a, I know what you're going to say. It was a 10 by 10 unit and they were renting it for $5 a month. What? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so I'm just like, you, you see that in these mom and pop stuff, like, you know, maybe it's like, you know, Bill who lives down the street from me, I'm going to get him a deal or whatever the case may be. I don't know in a small town, but like, yeah, we saw a 10 by 10 for $5 a month. Nice. It's amazing. And we didn't that know for sure. It could have had a dirt floor. We don't know, but uh, they yeah. just failed to raise it. <laughs> we, uh, we invested in a facility that had 80% occupancy, which isn't horrible in Grand Junction, Colorado. 
but it had an 80% delinquency and the owner could not get on top of this. Well, I mean, that's a real easy to fix the day you take over. I mean, look, you tell people pay or we're putting a lock on it and you're out. Yeah. And we have a leverage. We have leverage for them to pay. Not only is there no eviction moratorium on self storage, like there was right. on multifamily and single family, but in addition to that, we've got their stuff. Yeah, and so right. another facility we invested in in Beeville, Texas paid 2.4 million cash for, and within three months, just increasing the marketing, increasing rates to market levels, which are 25% higher, increasing occupancy, increasing management efficiencies. Had the value of this was appraised not at 2.4, which we paid for it. It was at 4.6. Oh, and wow. so at That's that awesome. time, put financing on it of 2 million, instead of that being like an 80% LTV, it was 43% of the new value and wow. then sold it for 4.6 million a year later, giving the investors, you know, that only had what half a million cash left in it, a, you know, a, about a five to one return. Wow. wow. We've got some comments <clears throat> on the side. We've got from, from Wendell Long, he says, I, I guess I'm one of those morons. He's, he's anything but a moron. He's <laughs> in self-storage. He actually taught me a lot about uh, self-storage. He's, he's a dear friend. And then we've got another one from David Smith. <clears throat> and yeah, it's on the, um, just the cap rate. So the value of a multi or a, well of a commercial property is based off of the net operating income which is the gross income minus all of the uh, expenditures, not including the debt. And then you divide that number by the cap rate, which is the rate of return that the market is looking for on a project, a project like that in that area. So in his example, it was a six cap rate, which is a 6% rate of return on that purchase price. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> <laughs> And yes, it will be that is is recorded and will be out there forever and ever. Amen. Right. <laughs> um, Paul, uh, we're running up on time. Thank you so much for for joining us. But good stuff. And don't go anywhere when we sign off. Uh, we want to properly thank you. But before we let you go, let's talk about your 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 fund. Um, Wellings Capital. Is it a um, Evergreen, can people get in and, and stay in, or, or is it uh, more of a syndication type of a fund? Uh, give us kind of an, an idea, over, you know, kind of an overview. Yeah, when we ba when we bailed on apartments after writing a book humbly titled The Perfect Investment, <laughs> uh, we, we decided we couldn't compete with all these guys who were, you know, who were getting these insider deals from brokers that they'd known for decades. And so we finally decided to look at self-storage and mobile home parks that have a lot more uh, mom and pop operators, a lot more potential upside intrinsic value, but we didn't have a track record. We didn't have a team. We didn't have the technology. So we decided, we went to our investors and said, hey, should we be a due diligence partner for you? And they said we should. So we decided to work with these investors to put together portfolios of these you know, portfolios that have different asset types, geographies, operators, strategies, and properties. And so we do that. And so we put those together in a number of funds. People can join the fund. It's basically a syndication. And our goal is to find operators who you probably wouldn't find on your own. They might not advertise or promote well, like the guy who's getting like 23% returns on his mobile home parks, but he doesn't know how to do a webinar or use Zoom or get investors. So we bring, you know, him like, you know, three or $4 million at a time and our investors get to enjoy those uh, types of returns. So at any rate, uh, that's what we do. Um, you've got the website there. And also I have some free materials if it would help to yeah. that understand cap rate, preferred return and other information at the website. Awesome. I'm sure David will take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Absolutely. We'll have that in the chat so people can easily click on uh, to your, to your website. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. Good stuff. Um, Thank you. Um, great content. I know everyone will enjoy it. Um, and since it's recorded, they'll continue to enjoy it. <laughs> can, can people still get onto your po podcast? Uh, I don't think you're doing it anymore. How to lose money. Mm -hmm. You know, we stopped the podcast a, years, uh, a year ago. We found 238 ways to lose money, and we were just tired. 
Because uh, <laughs> I was going to say we could be two hundred and thirty-nine. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, th I thought you were on there, I, Wendy, four years I ago. Could. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, the, the podcast is still available. All 238 painful episodes are on Apple, iTunes, Stitcher, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, you can access those through my website as well. Yeah, that's that's great information. Learn learn from other people's mistakes. Yep. Exactly. <clears throat> All right, folks. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is the Real Estate Investor Show, Real Estate for Hard Money. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Hard money for real estate investors. <laughs> this is only like our 200 and some odd episode. I still can't get the name right. We are Carolina hard money, uh, Carolina capital management. If you are interested in borrowing money, please go to carolinahardmoney.com and click on the apply now tab. If you are a passive investor looking for passive investment. And he's reading this folks. He has a teleprompter. Uh, I can't read. I can't spell. <laughs> I anyway, by the way, I can't count either. Don't so forget to hit the accredited investor tab and don't forget <laughs> to like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, sign up with Wednesdays with Wendy. Whew. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.